So I speak to you today on the 11th of June, 2020. Now the date is significant because exactly 10 years ago today, on the 11th of June, 2010, well, South Africa hosted the World Cup. And on that day, the very first day, the opening game took place between Bafana Bafana and Mexico. So I have a sense as I talk to you and over the next month, there'll be some serious reminiscing from myself and from yourself and every one of us looking at the times we had together. Now we know at the end of it all, unfortunately, Bafana Bafana did not win the World Cup. In fact, they didn't even qualify for the next stage. The only country in the world, the only host nation never to advance to the second stage. But beyond the, the national team, beyond Bafana Bafana, we all have our own 2010 World Cup story. So I think even now as I talk to you, hashtag 2010 World Cup is trending around the country. We all have our story. So you have yours. Let me tell you mine. So in the build-up, I was working at at SAFM Radio, uh, part of the SABC, but very importantly, I was also in the build-up to the World Cup, hosting a television show for SABC News International, uh, which in fact is the forerunner to the SABC News channel on DSTV right now, okay? And what working for, for that channel allowed me to do was to do a series of interviews uh, of, of footballers, um, and football administrators from South Africa, but also from around the African continent and around the world, very many FIFA uh, delegates as well, all in that whole, what, six months build up to the World Cup. So, and that was fantastic. So, much to my dismay, however, the SABC did not have the money to continue the entire channel and come end of March 2010, a few months before the World Cup, that whole SABC News International channel was shut down. So that meant that people like myself didn't have the platform that we had in the build-up to the World Cup now that the World Cup was upon us. So of course I was still involved with SAFM Radio, but I knocked doors or knocked on some doors on SABC Top Sport at that time. And although everybody knew me, they literally set me from pillar to post. My agenda was not to broadcast games, I mean, that was somebody else's problem, but I felt I could offer um, a, a social political analysis um, of the World Cup, including football, uh, to, to an audience, okay? And really, I was shafted around and I never even got a no. I just got a case of ask somebody else and ask somebody else and ask somebody else, and it never quite happened. So, about a week or so before the World Cup, I was in a position where I had no regular World Cup platform. And that was crazy for someone like myself who was a big football fan, um, but also being a patriot in my country, you wanted to do something for the World Cup, for 2010, and you do it for nothing, quite honestly, you know, hashtag play your part, right? So it looked like it was going to just sweep by and nothing was going to happen. But then I started getting inquiries from international agencies who wanted someone who knew soccer, who knew football, but also knew the unique social, political nuances of South Africa. And they needed someone to be able to do short interviews with them in, in sound bites, short, sharp, to the point, and to bring that all together, okay? So as a result of that, the fact that I was not contracted to anybody else besides SAFM, I was available, I, was, I had the time to do just that. So what then happened? I ended up doing analysis on the news channels, not on sport, on the news channels, uh, bringing soccer and society together for, for CNN International, and then Al Jazeera English, and CBC Canada. And I did that throughout the World Cup. And that was fantastic, because it gave me, well, it afforded me the privilege, of really a front seat at the table, or maybe in this case, the grandstand, to deliver this message around the world. And I, had the privilege, therefore, to speak to people like Robin Kerno from CNN, together with Aisha Cisse, and conversations uh, sometimes even off the air with, with people like Pedro Pinto, uh, who now, I think, works for UEFA or FIFA, perhaps, but then was with CNN, um, and uh, with others within Al Jazeera as, uh, as well, right? Uh, and that was just 
fantastic. It, it gave me that opportunity that would not have happened if I was contracted to somebody locally. So I think big message for me, doors close, but doors open up in ways that you just can't dream about, isn't it? Uh, many others, even with Al Jazeera, not so much on air. Uh, Tembisa, Ibrahim Fakoudi, so he had lots of chats with you and Imran Garda, my cousin, was working at Al Jazeera then. Did lots of um, analysis when, when he was there and I was in South Africa, which was, which was great. Uh, Jane Dutton was now with ENCA. Uh, at that stage, was working for Al Jazeera and on the beat of the World Cup uh, in South Africa. And there were many more. Some of the names escaped me, okay? So that was the on-air work, which was fantastic. But then I was also a football fan, right? So I managed to go as a fan to... And before I get there, you know, in, in doing the analysis, it meant standing up on, on scaffoldings in cold winter weather. Uh, uh, Robin Kerner, you would remember that. In, in chilly weather outside the FNB Stadium, it's freezing in the early parts of the morning uh, all throughout the World Cup, right? But as a football fan, I wanted to go to matches, not to work, but to go and watch and support. And we had planned for it, and I had the privilege to watch, I think, about 12 matches physically at stadiums. That included the first game of the World Cup, the opening game, included the final of the World Cup, included both semi-finals, so the, the Tuesday semi-final in Cape Town and the, and the Wednesday semi-final in, uh, in Durban. And the interesting story of the, of the second semi-final, uh, so I got to both games, okay, and the second semi-final, my, my son and I, Zaid, we, we flew from Cape Town to Durban, so Joba, Cape Town, Cape Town to Durban the very next day. And you may remember that Cape Town, the flights to Durban, there was a problem with landing rights and there were massive delays for thousands of people flying in to Durban on that day of the semi-final. So we got, we landed so late, I think like 45 minutes before the start of the game at the newly uh, built uh, King Shaka International Airport, 40 kilometers outside of Durban Central. And by the time the taxi drove us to close to the stadium, that whole area was a no, uh, no goes no-go zone, in fact. So we got dropped off in a no-go zone on the highway about two kilometers from the stadium. And that meant us running really back, back at all to Moses Madiba Stadium, uh, Moses Mabita Stadium, rather, uh, getting there and uh, exhausted and actually getting, I think we missed three minutes of the start of that, of that second semi-final. Um, yeah, exhausted, but we got there. Now, outside of that, the memories were incredible. It allowed myself and my family to spend lots of time bonding around the World Cup. Probably the most, the, you know, the, the, the biggest highlight for me was the, was, the, was the Ghana game against Uruguay, that uh, quarterfinal of the World Cup. It was the highlight. It was the most passionate game of the World Cup for me. It is also the saddest game because, as we know, Ghana should have gone to the finals, go to the semi-final, and... Uh, that ball that was heading into the net was saved by the hand of Suarez. So that didn't go in. Then the penalty, he got sent off. Then the penalty missed by Asamoah uh, Gyan in the last second of the game. And it went to a penalty shootout. And Ghana lost out with uh, Uruguay uh, winning that on penalty. So that was the, the most emotional game of the World Cup for me, more than any other. But also the, the saddest game of them all, right? Um, as far as the, the, the coldest game, I think it was, it was a Brazil game that played at, uh, at Ellis Park, uh, probably against the Koreans. It was bitterly, bitterly cold. And we had blankets and people did the Mexican wave. You didn't want them to stand up because it was, it was that cold. The opening game, of course, had its own memories. And I'll talk about that in a second. For me, because it started at 2 o'clock, which means for many people of the Muslim faith who performed the, the Friday Juma prayer, uh, there was a problem. You either miss the game or you miss the Juma, and both of them were not acceptable. So many people of the Muslim community then rallied together to create the, the Juma prayer, I think at Coral Brick, outside FNB Stadium, and about 5,000 incredibly people pitched up in their Bafana Bafana yellow, watching, uh, rather performing the, the prayer, the Juma Friday prayer, before they then moved across to the stadium across the road and then pray, took their seat and prayed for Bafana Bafana before their opening game against, uh, against Mexico. So that, those were scenes quite incredible. I'd love it if you could, if you could share that with me with your own video clips and, and your pictures. As far as the, that opening game, we know that 
St. Peter Shabalala scored a glorious goal, goal in that opening game. And that goal, the first goal of the World Cup, was also judged the goal of the World Cup. My, my big wish was, I so wish that glorious goal by St. Peter Shabalala. Shaba was the last goal of the World Cup. Didn't quite happen that way. But those are my memories of uh, 2010. There are many, many more, including the supporters and everybody asking for tickets whenever you met them uh, and where you're sitting and what block and what, what section and, and then going to places like St. and City and watching the fans of Mexico and Australia and all the other countries of the world. Also think about it, I stand to be corrected, two of the greatest footballers in the world took part in that World Cup. Um, Lionel Messi and Cristiano Ronaldo and incredibly I think they didn't score a single goal between the two of them. Maybe one from Ronaldo, but it, that happened, okay, which shows you that great players alone don't make a team. You need an entire team to do just that. But that's the World Cup 2010 for me, my snapshot. Share your thoughts. I'd love to know. I'm Ashraf Garda and that's my point.